After a decade of largely mediocre critical consensus on new Sonic games, it was clear that the series needed a bold new direction. One that could separate itself from the creative stagnation of supposedly original titles like Sonic 4, Lost World, and Forces, and the extreme lack of polish in Rise of Lyric, Team Sonic Racing, Colors Ultimate, and Origins. Sonic Frontiers aims to be just that. An experience that redefines 3D Sonic and sets the standard for the next decade, letting the Hedgehog cut loose in freeform environments and destroy his titanic foes with style and a little bit of edge. Experience Sonic like never before. Instead, Frontiers offers a worst-of highlight reel of everything the franchise has struggled with since Sonic Colors, shamelessly repeating the exact same mistakes and a few new ones. Blatantly recycled level themes and entire layouts from prior, better games in the series, a shallow button-mashing combat system comprised of functionally identical cinematic attacks and needless time-wasting RPG systems, all strung between Quixel Megascan's environments of tedious, map-filling Among Us tasks, populated with bite-sized chunks of Sonic Forces-style automated level design. Sonic Team doesn't owe me a game tailored to my exact tastes, but at the same time, I don't owe them my time and money if their output doesn't interest me, which is why I'm playing this game through Steam's family share system. I didn't pay a cent for Frontiers, I refuse to financially support what is, in my opinion, another bad Sonic game. And I don't expect any of the upcoming free updates to address my fundamental issues with the experience. I also have little faith that Tails, Knuckles, and Amy's new campaigns will be much more than a few cyberspace levels, or something else that's equally disappointing, but I'd love to be proven wrong. Since I didn't enjoy this game, I'm focusing solely on my major issues as to not waste more of my own free time, and I apologize if some points aren't explained as in-depth as you'd like. I'll recommend some other videos later that I agree with very strongly, but I will advise upfront that you should watch JebTube's excellent Sonic Fan Tears review, detailing many of the issues that I've had with the current direction of the franchise and the sad state of its core fanbase. Welcome to the evolution of Sonic games. It's not a particularly original observation, but Frontiers genuinely looks like a game design student's first attempt at placing Sonic into the Unreal Engine. I don't say this to mock the quality of the environments themselves, but they appear to be designed for a completely different game, only to have Sonic Forces level design hastily pasted on top. The day-night cycle is alright, until you notice all the shadows moving in staggered steps, and various other graphical oddities. Whoa, the f***ing FOV and on the camera is f***ing up there. What? What? Why is it like stretched out? What? Looked like it wasn't. The texture of the rainbow rings looks broken. The subsurface scattering on Sonic's tan skin occurs at the wrong lighting angles. The water shader flickers with its busted reflections. And as you likely already know, environmental objects, light, and shadows are constantly popping in and out of existence. This would look inexcusably bad in any game, but Sonic's above average movement speed only accentuates the problem. While I think the enemy designs are a misguided departure from the stylized fun of Sonic's cartoonish roots, I will give the game some credit for the spectacle of seeing Wyvern flying above Ares Island long before you ever have to fight it. This boss is probably the best in the game, mostly for its high speed as you saw over the map you were previously exploring on foot. Too bad it's interrupted with pace-breaking black screens, and nothing in the game's soundtrack is able to elevate content like this beyond just being okay. I'm really not a fan of this focus on screamo vocals and dubstep, and I'd love to see lead composer Tomoya Otani return to his more orchestral style from 06 through to Lost World. Cyberspace may be slightly more visually appealing than the open zones, but only from its embarrassing asset recycling from Sonic Generations, a game from 2011 that still looks better, is immensely more fun, and has already been recycled in almost every Sonic game since. I can't wait to see how they contrive Green Hill's reappearance in the next game, 
or if they once again advertise five massive islands when the last two are essentially just the first island again. Some of the cutscene animation may be acceptable, but we still have yet to see a 3D Sonic game that properly utilizes his expressive character design, opting instead for rigid, janky motions and long, awkward holds between lines of dialogue. It's very difficult for me to get excited during the Dollar Store Metal Gear Rising boss fights when Super Sonic abruptly snaps between poses and has worse overall animation than games from 10 years ago. As a minor nitpick, the new velvety material on Sonic's fur is a strange inclusion that I find distracting in close-up, and his eye material looks really bad, as if its normals have been flipped the wrong way around. I don't think this is the first time I've had to say this, but this might be the worst Sonic has ever sounded. His deep voice and slow delivery have reached a level I previously would have attributed to unmistakable parody, but no, this is just how Sonic sounds now. He took your home world. He took your lives. Are you going to let him do it all over again? I don't enjoy Knuckles' new voice either, and everybody else comes off as distant and bored, particularly Dr. Eggman. This seems to be an intentional decision in the voice direction across the whole game, and I do not like it whatsoever. The bleak tone doesn't feel justified by the game's narrative, which is borderline inconsequential. The lack of meaningful moments is disguised under a hollow mystery, and I couldn't care less about the origins of the Chaos Emeralds, because filling out unsatisfactory lore on a wiki page isn't the same as providing an emotionally satisfying story. There's an attempt at humanizing Eggman through his AI daughter Sage, but I'm sorry to say that I simply do not care, and the poor presentation does it no favors. Many serious moments simply made me laugh, and any drama is completely undercut due to a lack of consequences. Like when Sonic is immediately relieved of his corruption after hours of buildup, and when Sage is resurrected by Eggman after her sacrifice that all the other characters don't seem to care about. Sonic comic veteran Ian Flynn has certainly improved the dialogue when compared to past games, but I have to say I'm really not happy with the final outcome. I do enjoy some moments, mostly between Sonic and Knuckles, but the incessant lore references and laughable flashback stills are distracting and again, unintentionally hilarious. Yes, I know what Sonic is too, but can we move on now and actually get something new? A middle ground between soulless baby dialogue and melodramatic deep cut callbacks can absolutely be met, and I'd love to see that in whatever it is that Flynn contributes to next. Some elements just don't feel quite appropriate in this context either, like Knuckles' desire to be free despite his role on Angel Island. This makes complete sense in the comics, where Knuckles is frequently off-limits for stories on the mainland, but in the game series, his role as a lonely guardian in the sky has been meaningless since Sonic Adventure, almost 25 years ago. Acknowledging Tails' cowardice in Forces may seem like the right way to move forward, but I honestly would have preferred we just ignored the clear inconsistencies in this mismanaged series and moved on by setting a new example, rather than earning Sonic fan Twitter points by winking at the camera to say, we fixed it. But if there's one thing Frontiers certainly has not fixed, it's the way the player interacts with the level design, and this is my biggest, most fundamental issue with the game. Sonic is a series that thrives on stylish, expressive traversal mechanics across levels designed with that fluidity in mind, but the Starfall Islands fail to complement Sonic's movement, and his character controller is absurdly broken. He will routinely jitter on any surface that isn't perfectly flat. All I'm doing is just holding the stick up. This is all I'm doing. I'm not pressing anything else. And he's like, <coughs> he's, he's like gluing onto the sides. 
launch unexpectedly into the air from the tiniest change in elevation, and stick to all manner of surfaces at awkward angles regardless of his speed. Like, he sticks to it or he goes like... Even- even this tree! Even this f***ing tree! How do you not see the problem with that? It would've been nice if you had like a bespoke animate. Really? It's baffling that such minor bumps in the ground exist in the first place, as Sonic has historically favoured smoother topography with lots of sloped surfaces. These tiny rocks in the floor are not only considered ramps for Sonic to spontaneously launch from, they can also break his Psyloop trail, which is incredibly annoying when you're trying to fight the enemies that have just spawned directly on top of them. I like that Sonic can be launched off the terrain at all, but I do not appreciate how many times it happened by complete accident. The only consistent method I found was to use these ugly, hard-edged block platforms, but they are unfortunately at the mercy of Sonic's super-glued feet. It should feel rewarding to use all your built-up speed to jump over long distances, but Sonic's jump counterintuitively kills all of his speed. Because his feet are coated in glue, it's almost impossible to launch Sonic horizontally off a cliff, because he'd rather stick to the lip and run straight down, a jarring transfer of momentum that feels very unnatural. Homing attacks annoyingly don't carry any momentum, as per usual, but also send Sonic slightly backwards. Frequent 2D sections on Chaos Island abruptly harm the player's hypothetical sense of flow, and certain automated sequences actively lock the player's input. I tried to punch this box, but Sonic decided to homing attack onto this pulley, which trapped me in an automated array of gimmicks regardless of how much I was mashing the jump button to escape. The series' iconic loop-to-loops aren't part of the environment that the player can seamlessly navigate, but a series of block platforms strewn together with dash panels, often made of the game's climbing material to ensure that Sonic never falls off of them, or carries any of his momentum. The one time in the game I was impressed that it actually let me engage with a loop in uninterrupted 3D gameplay was just a 2D section that failed to transition properly. This is all emblematic of Frontier's lack of faith in the player to control the main character, in a subgenre known for freedom and experimentation, and it's honestly insulting. Abnormally so, when many of these issues aren't new for Sonic, including the large variety of bugs. Some rails would consistently send me flying in the opposite direction, I've had Sonic fall right through the floor, and I witnessed him floating in midair on the very night the game was released, along with many other curious occurrences. But if I go That's off so of any cool. spring, I can't, I, even this one, I can't, it automates me onto the ledge! I just, I find it so baffling, this is an open world Wait, what? Oh, okay. oh my god. Well, okay, well, I'm not getting it. Exactly, instead of shooting ahead, you know, what, what, what? Instead of shooting Guys, ahead, you now just stop. They fixed it. <laughs> wow. <laughs> what is what's going on? Hold it earlier before Ted's stream. Hey, oh, okay. <laughs> I cannot think of a major release I've played in the last decade that was this broken, but patching out some glitches won't compensate for Sonic's unsatisfying movement across such bland level design. Mario Odyssey provides a more substantial difference in speed when running down hills, along with proper rolling physics. Metroid Prime's Morph Ball also has rolling physics. Breath of the Wild has shield surfing down slopes. Countless fan games have adapted similar systems, and yet the official Sonic the Hedgehog open world debut hit has basically nothing. I wonder how the crowd, who sincerely believe that physics don't matter in 3D Sonic games, were feeling when they first encountered this atrocious, mandatory pinball minigame. I've had more fun exploring the one level of the fan-made Sonic Utopia with no clear objective than I ever did completing the tedious busywork in Frontiers, because Sonic's movement was intrinsically rewarding. This is why I frequently gravitate to games with enjoyable movement mechanics. The extrinsic motivation of Frontiers doesn't interest me. None of these bare-bones collect-a-thon platforming sections are fun in their own right, or offer any form of challenge. Frontiers never feels like a test of skill, 
a rather a test of patience, which is especially true for its mindless combat system. Almost every encounter can be beaten by mashing a single button or holding down the unlimited projectile kick that minces enemy health bars. The only exceptions are when you need to siloop around foes that cover themselves with shields, or avoid attacks with a parry that doesn't require any specific timing and allow Sonic to float indefinitely in the air. In my experience, every other ability is entirely superfluous. They all offer free damage and some kind of scripted cinematic animation that may appear flashy, but has zero substance or versatility. As a longtime fan of stylish action titles, and the guy who asked for Platinum Games to develop a Sonic spin-off, the glaring subpar similarities to their catalog was very distracting. It's clear this was Sonic Team's intention. There's witch time, QTE button mashing sequences, YB torture attack prompts to activate context sensitive cinematic moves, the Psyloop is basically the Wonderliner from the Wonderful 101 and the titular Astral Chain, Supersonic does wicked weaves, and each Titan boss fight is clearly inspired by the iconic foes of Metal Gear Rising and Bayonetta. Adapting Sonic into this style of gameplay does have potential, but I expect substantial improvements in future games so I'm not just running past every enemy I see. Frontiers lacks the commitment towards pushing players into the fun zone that these other action titles have always done so well. Truly open-ended sandboxes with no limitations may sound fun on paper, but playing on god mode gets boring fast. What if instead of flying mini-bosses spawning grind rails or Sonic Colors style quickstep platforms in the sky, I had to use the environment to dynamically gain the speed required to launch Sonic into the air and reach these enemies head on? This would create a sense of empowerment through versatile movement to overcome adversity, rather than handing me the solution on a silver platter. What if instead of spamming the same projectile kick every fight, this move could only be performed as a short combo finisher, akin to Bayonetta's Wicked Weaves, forcing me to think while in battle and use some skill. These kinds of limitations would have ironically made Frontiers more open-ended and rewarding, instead of encouraging complacency by never allowing the player to make meaningful decisions. To illustrate this further, here's some incredibly insightful examples from Matthew Matosis, possibly the most thoughtful yet entertaining game critic I've had the pleasure of watching. Nintendo have always been good at giving people something they didn't know they wanted yet. Here's my attempt at that. People think they don't want inconveniences, but I think they do, to a certain extent anyway. Every game has some kind of challenge to overcome, otherwise they'd all be about no clipping to the end and one-shotting the final boss. Struggle is a fundamental part of play. Here's something you might have a hard time coming to terms with. Breath of the Wild isn't a great game because you can climb and parasail anywhere. It's a great game in spite of that. People think they want complete control over their experience when what they really want is to cut down trees to cross ravines, something they'll never actually do if they have complete control over their experience. And here's some further words of wisdom from Hugo Martin, game director of Doom Eternal, one of my favorite games of all time. We, we want to give you something to master, you know, because the, the power of fantasy that is earned is, is far more satisfying than the one that is just handed to you. Mm. You know, on paper, you think, well, we, sh we should just let people play the way they want to play. Mm. You know, there's really no game that's like that. There's right. Nothing. To hold the player accountable, to not let them out of the fun zone. You know, the fun zone is managing resources. It's doing all these different things. It's thinking constantly. It's using the right tool for the job. It's all these different things. And when they don't play that way, we kill them. This is what bothers me so much about Sonic Frontiers. It's paradoxically too railroaded and automated while also feeling too open and laissez-faire. After all, why take all those automated grind rails to collect every memory token, or fight all those annoying mini-bosses, when you can just visit Big the Cat and skip over the game's content? The game does not care if you play it properly, but even if you do, it's still boring. Imagine not needing to time your parries in Sekiro. 
imagine if Sea of Thieves had private PvE alliance servers to avoid the risk of PvP. Imagine if Dante could kill all his enemies with a few long-range bullets. Now, imagine if Sonic could follow an on-screen waypoint by endlessly boosting across a mostly flat plane, devoid of interesting obstacles or environmental interaction, other than hand-holding grind rails and dash panels. Imagine if we forcefully stripped out every element of challenge, risk, and skill-based mastery of your favorite video games, even the easier ones. I don't want to turn my brain off, I want to be engaged. I'd recommend Under the Mayo's video Challenge Matters if you'd like to understand this concept more in depth. As per usual, terminally online Sonic fans refused to let anyone express their negative opinions of an upcoming Sonic game without initiating a dogpile. The exact same things happened during the pre-release of Sonic Forces and even the Sonic movie of last year, but of course we all just forgot that happened and made the same mistakes all over again. The cycle must be getting shorter than ever. Someone who told me they were dogpiled and gaslit by Frontiers defenders later told me, after the game had released and they enjoyed it, that there was no toxic fan reaction for Frontiers at all. It wasn't just random nobodies doing this, as certain popular accounts with relatively large influential followings were directly participating in this behaviour, one of whom quote retweeted Nintendo Life's Negative Frontiers review to their 20,000 followers. I don't wish to condemn this individual or ignite any drama, but nothing good is going to come from actions like this, and they are entirely responsible for enabling harassment. I wouldn't hold this against them had they simply accepted responsibility when myself and others pointed out that this wasn't a good look, but they chose instead to double down on their toxicity. Claiming that the review needs to accurately reflect the game, which is impossible as this is entirely subjective, and make sense compared to others in the series, is ridiculous, especially when the Frontiers review they're referring to was by a completely different person of the same outlet. Even if they did think Forces was better, so what? It's ironic that this same person was also on the receiving end of toxicity during the game's pre-release period, as they were acknowledging many of the game's flaws in the early footage. Now that it's out, and they've done some paid work promoting it, it's seemingly okay to instigate the same harm towards other people who didn't like the game. There is nothing objective about sharing your own personal thoughts on art, and as Ian Flynn made clear, there is no reason to dogpile people for disagreeing with the majority opinion. Anecdotally, many Sonic fans deliberately kept quiet about their opinions on Frontiers during this time, due to their understandable fear of harassment. Video Game Donkey released a Frontiers video that concluded with a showcase of critically acclaimed games with lower Metacritic user scores compared to Frontiers, quite clearly to outline his confusion over the game's positive reception. Sonic fans who were already mad that he didn't like the game, pretending that he was intentionally causing glitches to occur and other nonsense complaints, used this as some moral high ground when the Metacritic user score for Frontiers had, at the time I witnessed this unfold, dropped by a whopping 2% from review bombing. Because Sonic fans value the perceived success of a product over the life and well-being of real people. Unlike the previous example, Dunkey wasn't linking his audience directly towards anyone else, rather to a website that aggregates meaningless numbers, and I genuinely don't think he intended for anyone to start review bombing. I can't think of another way for him to illustrate a disagreement with popular audience opinion without showing some kind of statistic like this. And the same thing happens every time people complain about the tomato meter of some new mediocre movie. Review bombing is absolutely stupid and pointless, but it's ultimately harmless, particularly one as insignificant as this. And when Sonic fans created Metacritic accounts simply to spam their own perfect scores in response. Sonic fans cried that Frontiers was robbed of the player's voice category at the Game Awards, but this is factually untrue, it's not up for debate. 
This isn't an award for some sense of agreed upon subjective standards like best action game or game of the year. It's literally a community driven popularity contest with no regards to perceived quality. Which game had more fans click on its button? It wasn't Sonic Frontiers. It lost to one of the most popular ongoing games on the market right now, regardless of what your opinions are on either title. It objectively did not deserve the award for biggest number, and there was no reason for anyone to get angry about it. One person claimed Sonic fans were being annoying and conspiratorial about the whole thing, and Sonic fans decided to unknowingly prove them right by harassing them until they protected their account. What does this behaviour prove? More recently, a news article made an unfunny joke about Sonic 06, and Sonic fans decided to show how much they don't care about this by harassing the writer until they too had to protect their account. All of this nonsense has been surrounded by a general aura of gatekeeping, complaints about objectivity and bias from people who don't know what they're talking about, and claims that comparing the Sega published Sonic Frontiers to the indie darling Spark the Electric Jester is somehow unfair to Sonic. I publicly advocated that we don't harass people when the Frontiers reviews came out, and then afterwards I was known as the guy who defended every negative Frontiers review, failing to understand the common themes that may have influenced me into doing so. Telling others not to bully people is just so narcissistic of me. Reviews don't matter, unless they're the ones I agree with. I couldn't even post clips of Sonic's super glued feet breaking a dash panel driven 2D section without people completely losing their minds. This glitch that I was assured didn't matter and would obviously be patched, happened to me on my first run of that level, five months after the game's launch. It can also occur on slopes over bottomless pits. I was even accused of lying about this when someone found footage of this section working correctly. As someone who programs pipeline tools for the Unreal Engine in my day job, I'd argue that an inconsistent glitch is much worse than one that can be easily recreated, as they're way harder to debug. I wasn't even allowed to suggest that the Chow Garden would have been an appropriate inclusion in the game, and in the end, this is why I basically quit Twitter last year. It ideally should be the other way around, where the ones creating a toxic environment are kicked out, but choosing to leave the platform on your own accord is unfortunately the only reliable way for victims to avoid further harm. I'm not allowed to insult these hardworking paid developers by criticizing a piece of commercial art that they worked on in a language they don't speak in a video or tweet on my own personal account that they will never see or watch. But these people think it's okay to insult me and others directly to our faces, ironically claiming it to be their own valid criticism, and spread it to all of their followers so that the outrage can continue. Maybe you think we shouldn't care about this kind of toxicity. After all, it's just words on the internet. But so are the reviews and tweets that these same people are getting mad about in the first place. Maybe they should be the ones to ignore opinions they disagree with, instead of sending hundreds if not thousands of angry Sonic fans to the next controversial take, and expecting their victims to accept blatant harassment. All because some people didn't like a new video game about a cartoon blue hedgehog. Frontier's only noticeable merit is that it's better than Sonic Forces, although I'd argue at least Forces doesn't kill your speed when jumping and isn't bloated with over 10 hours of pointless filler. It often seems we aren't satisfied with Frontiers because it was good on its own, but because we think the next game might be. If it was some bold creative direction, then I don't think Sonic fans would be tweeting at the game's director with links to Sonic Retro forum posts about 3D Sonic level design, or the basic principles of Sonic's movement from previous games. A Sonic team a visionary studio of trailblazers? 
Or are they infantilized, mindless puppets who can't think for themselves? What worries me most about Frontier's success is that Sonic fans will likely use it as a shield to deflect pre-release criticism of future releases. Remember when Frontiers looked bad, but it ended up being peak? Stop being a hater, and just ignore the fundamental issues you have with the early footage, they will obviously fix it. I shouldn't need to explain how this kind of argument is incredibly stupid and anti-consumer, but also plainly misinformed. We live in an era of unfinished Sonic games that are essentially abandoned upon release, unless they choose to sell the game back to you again at a higher price. The fact that Sonic fans celebrated when embarrassingly bad footage released five months before launch was indeed from an early build reminds me that many of these people don't understand game development whatsoever. The problem with this reveal wasn't just that the person was playing badly, or in a way that wasn't very entertaining, it was that the game let them get away with playing like this. Stand still in Doom and you'll be dead in a few seconds. Fail to consider your surroundings, or simply run out of stamina, while climbing a tower in Breath of the Wild and you'll fall back to the ground. There's no problem solving in Sonic Frontiers when all the hard work is done for you, with no punishment for lazy play. If you don't know where to go, just find the one spring or grind rail that takes you to the next chunk of automated level design. The best part is that, as anyone at the time could have told you, nothing was going to fundamentally change from that footage compared to the final release. I'd argue that if not for subtle changes in the time of day, or minor tweaks to the game's animations and user interface, you probably wouldn't notice that this background footage isn't the original IGN reveal at all. This is the released build of the game. If you couldn't tell the difference, then that's exactly the point I'm trying to make. Sonic is a diverse and malleable series. I think it has a lot of potential for bold creative choices and outlandish gimmicks that you don't see in other games. But that's the issue. Nothing about Sonic Frontiers feels like it couldn't be done in any other game. Instead of playing to Sonic's unique strengths, it tries to make him just as formulaic and homogenized as all of his contemporaries. This isn't Sonic's Breath of the Wild moment, because that game was designed as a modern reinterpretation of what made the original Zelda work in the first place. Frontiers has abandoned most of Sonic's core elements beyond the superficial, because if this truly was a return to form, I'd be here praising the game's fluid controls, momentum-based movement, swinging soundtrack, and gorgeous art direction. Is there momentum in Sonic Frontiers? Now, not in the traditional sense, right? It may be tiring to hear me repeat most of the same points every time I critique a recent Sonic game, but I'm getting tired of every Sonic game consistently having the same problems. The murder of Sonic the Hedgehog, the free April Fool's point-and-click spin-off, was the most satisfied I felt with a Sonic game since Mania. I cried at the Sonic Symphony, I really enjoyed the animated Frontiers prologue, and I still read the IDW comics. But otherwise, Sonic hasn't been doing it for me anymore. I haven't even watched Sonic Prime because I just don't care enough, and it seemed to drop from all discussion within days of its release. I don't think it should come as a surprise to anyone that my last three videos haven't been about Sonic at all. Until Sega stops rushing out unfinished, cash-grab Sonic products, I'm not expecting a sequel to this game to truly captivate me. I think even the most hardcore Frontiers fans probably want a lot of the same things I do. I just happen to be more vocal about it in the hope of some genuine improvement. God knows that Sonic still needs it. If you'd like to hear more about my thoughts on Frontiers, I'd recommend all of these great videos, as I agree with almost everything in them. I'm also very happy to announce that I will be attending Sonic Revolution on June 11th at the Carson Event Center in California, so if you'd like to say hi, I'd love to meet you. In the meantime, I'd like to get back to playing games that I actually enjoy. Maybe someday, a new Sonic game will be one of them.